Hello everyone. I'm Donald LaCourse, the Artistic Director of Ethnic Dance Theatre, and we're here today to present to you a showing of the collection of Ethnic Dance Theatre costumes from the Balkans that we've been working on expanding and building for the last 47 years. We're going to start off our program today with costumes that came from Croatia. The costumes that you see here come from the villages just outside of the capital city of Zagreb. It's an area called Šestina in the region called Prigorje. This particular set of costumes, the two that we see here, were originally collected in Croatia in the late 1960s, early 1970s by Anthony Shea, who was the artistic director of the Amman Folk Ensemble in Los Angeles, a company that no longer exists, and we were very fortunate to be the recipient of some of their costumes. So as I said, this is the most, probably one of the most famous costumes in Croatia from around Zagreb. You're going to see that the costumes for the women and men are made from linen. And this is not a particularly rich um, agricultural area, so the embellishments on the costume are a little bit simpler, except for the braid work on the men's coat and on the women's sheepskin vest. If you take a good look at this sheepskin vest, Alina, would you turn around so we can see both sides here? It's tooled leather, little teeny tiny dots of um, punched out leather appliqued over the sheepskin to create this amazing mosaic sort of pattern. Um, the scarf is also very typical. It's, you find the headscarf all over Croatia. In fact, all, a lot of Eastern European, this is a cotton, hand-blocked, hand-printed sort of uh, headscarf. Some other details that I'd like you to take a look at is the very charming way the women would garter up their stockings, little, little red ribbon bows. The man has a very interesting headpiece also. His hat, called Sheshir, is from the uh, hatter, uh, milliner, and this high dome, almost a bowler sort of shape, but it doesn't have the wide brim of a bowler. And Matthew, if you could turn around for us. The incredible amount of sutash, or gaitani. Gaitan is a, a word for braiding. This was very definitely influenced by the Ottoman costume. Ottoman Empire was, had a major influence in the Balkans, and so these motifs you find throughout, and it reached all the way through the Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. Um, also, this particular one, his belt is hand-tooled and has the, in, uh, probably in porcupine, uh, not porcupine, peacock quills, um, the initials of the original owner of this particular costume. We're very excited to be able to show these costumes. We haven't actually worn them much in performance because we just have not, there aren't enough of them for us to do an entire choreography but dances or costumes from Zagreb, the Shestina area of Prigorje. Next, we're going to move on to Romania, an area called Muntania, which is surrounding area of the capital city of Bucharest. These costumes were collected by Vani Brown, originally a woman who came from North Dakota who became a very well-known folk dance teacher in the United States. She specialized in dances of Slovakia, but she had a company in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that no longer exists, and we were the fortunate recipients of an entire wardrobe of different costumes, and this, these two costumes come from her particular collection. You'll notice lots and lots of gold weaving, gold thread woven into the women's wrap skirt, which is called a fota. And the veil that she's wearing actually comes from the collection of a local woman who, Dana, whose last name now is escaping me, who works for Hora, the heritage organization of Romanian Americans here in Landmark Center. 
Um, so the particular veil is probably a little over 100 years old. It's uh, woven linen and silk. Uh, this costume was popularized at around the early 20th century by Queen Marie of Romania. Uh, she was photographed many times wearing a version of this and the, the embroidery or the weaving patterns are geometric in nature and you can, nowadays they are made with mylar thread but it was originally woven in with actual gold and silver thread. With the young man, we are also seeing again boiled wool, which is going to be a, a theme throughout the, our costume exhibition. So felted wool was used for both women and men's costumes. It's one of the oldest fibers known to humankind when we started making clothes. And so this one, the man's costume particularly, is decorated again with lots and lots of scroll work in frog sort of designs, which was, again, the influence of the Ottoman Turkish Empire that conquered a large part of the Balkan Peninsula. This young man is probably a shepherd. He's also wearing a sheepskin hat, which denotes his occupation, although it's become a popular thing with costumes in general. You didn't have to be a shepherd to have this sheepskin hat. So costumes from the region of Muntenia, the area around Bucharest, Romania. And now we come to a costume that is claimed by three of the Balkan countries. I initially knew it as being from the region of Kustendil, which is in Bulgaria, western Bulgaria, in the southwest. The Serbs also recognize this costume as coming from Bosilegrad, and the Macedonians from North Macedonia also say this costume is worn around the area of Kriva Palanka. When you look on a map, however, those three towns are very, very close together, and political boundaries obviously mean nothing compared to where the population is. So this particular costume was purchased on my first trip to Yugoslavia in 1975. We found it in an antique store in Skopje, and we, didn't, we were really doing this on a very, very shoestring budget, and so we didn't know whether or not it was something I could, we could purchase or not. And so I hid it behind some other things in this antique store in the hopes that if we came back to Skopje and we still had some money left, that I would be able to purchase this particular piece. It is made from boiled wool. As we talked about earlier, boiled wool is very, is one of the earliest uh, fabrics. It would probably be knit or woven and then boiled to, to create this condensed, heavy fabric. It's embroidered then with gold threads, and you'll notice that she's wearing a gold and silver apron. Those are actual really gold and silver threads in both the apron and her belt. And on the belt, she's wearing a buckle called a pafti. Pafti would be the way to finish off an outfit, and it was something that, again, came from the Ottoman Empire. It was originally worn by nobility in the Ottoman Empire, but uh, pafti made of nickel and brass and maybe plated with silver. And I was flabbergasted when I ran across this in this antique store, because I, I think we paid maybe $150 for it back then, which was an outrageous amount of money then, but this costume now would probably be around at least $800 and maybe $300 just for the apron alone and another $150 for the belt. So it's, it's a very rare piece. We're really excited to still have this. This one would be probably worn as a bridal costume. There's a nice scoop to the neck and she's wearing her dowry. This would be a festive wedding costume from, I would say this one is probably from the late 1890s. Using this as a model, we were able to make an entire set of reproductions that we use in ethnic dance theater. We've been wearing them probably for the last 
25 or 30 years. The bodice is very specific to this particular region. I, don't, I can't identify any other one except for another neighboring costumer that, which has a similar sort of shape. The other thing that is notable are the, the lace is also an area that they're known for the fine bobbin lace on the sleeves and also on the bottoms of the chemise. So when you get dressed, there's a full length shift chemise with sleeves underneath and then the saya, then the apron and belt, and sometimes there could be an overcoat over this as well. This one is a, obviously a winter costume also. They now make it more from cashmere and worsted wools, which are not nearly so heavy. In the summertime, they actually have a, uh, a white version of the same costume that would be probably a heavier linen embroidered with, with this in the same manner. Uh, so this particular costume again is of an, a people called the Shopi or Shopluk tribes that live in southwest Bulgaria, north, or it's southeast Serbia and northwest corner of, Bulgar of North Macedonia where those three countries all meet. And now we're going to go to eastern Serbia to the Homolia Mountains to see a man's costume of the Vlach people. The Vlach or Vlasi are a Romanian speaking people. As we know, political boundaries are just that. They're man imposed, they're not by ethnicity, population. So there's a large population of Vlach in current day Serbia. EDT does a suite of dances that we were taught a few years ago, and we've been collecting these, although almost all of our costumes for our Vlach costumes are stage reproductions. Most of our men's costumes that we have in our collection are stage reproductions, so this is a particular piece that I was able to find on eBay. Again, we find the boiled wool, which is ubiquitous throughout the Balkans, and the most famous thing about the Vlach dances and costumes in this particular region are the outrageous sheepskin hats that cover, you know, it's like fringes over the, the face of the wearer, and this is very unique to this particular sub-region of Serbia. So Vlach from the Homolia Mountains. And now we're going to northern Macedonia, to the area, the villages around the capital city of Skopje to see a costume from around Skopska Blatia. The chemise is linen with black wool embroidery and some of the unique features of this costume are the tapestry Kilim style apron which is gathered around the waist and there is a rather gruesome folkloric story about this that I'm not going to impart here. If you, Stasia, if you would turn around slowly for us so we can see your coat. This is a bridal coat that is worn and underneath it she has another entire coat and particularly with these you could tell what particular family, they were like tartans, they were each, the stripe, plain, sometimes they had a slight plaid, but the, these jackets were worn for work every day, and then adding, he had a much simpler apron, of course, for your everyday wear, but this particular apron, of course, would be for her wedding or festive occasion, and it has gold and silver threads woven in and these unique medallions. And we've been very lucky to collect these. The original pieces that Ethnic Dance Theater owned were collected in Macedonia in the early 1960s by a local folk dancer named Phyllis Cohen, who was a benefactor of Ethnic Dance Theater. She willed us all of her costumes over the years. And she traveled to Macedonia with her daughter, Elizabeth, 
back in the early 60s, shortly after the first trip to America of the wonderful Macedonian dance teacher, Athanas Kolorovsky, who stayed with the Cohen family in White Bear Lake. And so he invited them to go visit him and his family in Skopje, and they went there and came home with a whole bunch of costumes, about five or six of which now Ethnic Dance Theater has been the happy recipient, and I've been adding pieces here and there as they become available online where I, where I find them and on eBay, or there's a wonderful um, costume sharing uh, application on Facebook nowadays so you can find things. So this particular one, I would say again, this one probably come, dates to around 1910, 1920, and we're very happy to have it. And now we're going to go to the Albanian state of Kosova to around the town of Pristina to see a man's costume. These were collected at some time in the 70s by Anthony Shea and the Amman Folk Ensemble. I can't tell you much more than that, other than that this is the only Albanian costume in the Ethnic Dance Theater collection. Uh, and again, the famous boiled wool. These pants are so stiff that it's hard to imagine that their dances involve lots and lots of squats and things like that, and yet they do. Uh, Matthew got to do a dance in our repertoire and with squats, and it's also very low rise. Dances of the Albanians who live in Kosovo near Pristina. And now another costume from Romania, from Western Romania in the region called Hunedwara. And this one it comes from the town of Padureni. The fun story about this particular costume is that in 1995, Ethnic Dance Theater was on tour performing in Hungary and Bulgaria, and my brother Mark and I stayed after most of the ensemble left, and we were able to be in Budapest for St. Stephen's Day, which is the equivalent, perhaps, of the 4th of July. And we were up in the Cathedral Square area and happened upon an antique store and saw these costumes, and it wasn't just Hungarian costumes, but Romanian as well. And there were two of them in the window, or in, I don't remember if they were in the window specifically, or in the shop, and we came home with both of these costumes. We also got a lot of costumes from uh, further east of the Chango people that live in Moldova, but this was one of the particular prizes of that. Padureni, the, the dances are more partner dances, but th this is a very unique style, very heavily embroidered on the sleeves. Again, that raglan sleeve set in, so it's tightly gathered all the way around into the neckline. And in, in many cases in Romania, you have the front and back apron, and that is a remnant of the original clothing for when we used to wear furs and skins it would be a loincloth or, or two pieces of, of fabric or fur that, were, that covered your front and back. And those ancient styles of dress persist to this day in many ethnic costumes, especially around the Danube region. Um, this is a more contemporary one. I, the old front aprons probably were more woven instead of being store-bought cloth and trims and embroidery, but the idea is another one that we have is all woven and embroidered, so it, and again, covered with sequins. They, they're, the peasant people of this part of the world, as in many other parts of the world, like their sparkles, as don't we all. And now we return to Bulgaria for what is perhaps the treasure of the Ethnic Dance Theater collection, our costume, women's costumes from North Bulgaria, from around the villages around the town of Pleven. This is an area that is along the 
Danube River, which forms the border with Romania, and so you will see real similarities in the fact that there is a front and back apron. Uh, these costumes probably date to the late 1880s. The first pieces that we got in our collection were originally owned by the Cola de Folk Ensemble of Seattle, which I danced in back in 1973. And when the company folded in 1974, their assets were sold off, and we were able to purchase back then 10 women's costumes for $1,000 in 1975. Each of those costumes is worth probably at least that today. This particular one, though, I've been adding to the collection ever since then, and this one come, I found on eBay of all places and added it to the collection. This, the embroidery is so tiny. It's, I wish that we could get really, really close, but we're being COVID conscious, and so we're not going to get as close as we might. Uh, but there are lots of examples of this costume on Pinterest if you're interested. Um, geometric shapes and unusually the colors that they prefer in the old way old days were black and brown which were much easier natural dyes to create rather than the brightly colored things that you see on stage costumes today over the apron which is woven stripes are appliqued lots of pieces of gold thread tape pom-poms, rickrack, and sequins, and some old Turkish coins. And I was talking about the fact that she actually has, I'm going to have you turn a little bit, a kilted back skirt. So in the waist area, it's accordion pleated. It's in a couple of pieces, and it's very, very full. So when the dancing happens, when they do any movement, the, the skirts swish but it's, it's an open skirt. It's not like, a, not like a skirt that we think of. It's actually open here from, he, from hip to hip, and then the apron goes in front. The coat also, I'm going to turn you around again, is, has great little detailing under the arm where you tip, wouldn't typically worry about detailing, but again, boiled wool. And the headdress she's wearing really is typical, most typical, of St. Lazarus Day, which is the Saturday before Easter, the day after Good Friday. And it's a holiday in Slavic villages, in Bulgaria and Macedonia particularly, where young girls go caroling from house to house. And it really is a carryover of ancient pagan spring rituals of reawakening the earth, just as the Lazarus story is a talk, is a parable of reanimation, bringing back to life. The carryover is with bringing the earth back to life and bringing the spring. And now we travel to Romania, to the Satu Mare County in northwestern Romania, to the villages of the Oash people. This is an Another antique that, believe it or not, I found on eBay. EDT doesn't own its own Oash costumes, except for this one. We have an Oash suite in our repertoire, but we were very fortunate that this Radost Folk Ensemble of Seattle loan, gave us a long-term loan, which has now been returned to them because they're now doing the dance themselves. Uh, this is a very different costume than a lot of other Romanian costumes in that it's uh, a blouse and short skirt. And the ape, you can see that it's the embroidery on the shoulders and across the waist and sleeves is a chenille embroidery. So it's probably done with a, like a punch needle to give it a little looped effect. It's very different than the cross stitch slant stitch and, and satin stitch things that you might see in other costumes. Um, the dances and music of this region are famous throughout Romania. It's very different than other dances. And now the current costumes have become almost like tutus, which was not, when you look at old costumes, they were not like this. The same 
linen uh, or cotton canvas has now been stiffened and added extra layers and, so that, and layers so that they stand out like this and then they're much shorter even than this one. So this one probably dates from, I would guess, probably the 1940s, 30s or 40s. And you could turn it for us slowly. The skirt has little tucks and the very bottom of the, of the skirt also has that same chenille embroidery. Very simple costume. It's way up in the mountains and primarily they make their, they're made their living raising sheep. And the big festival every year is the gathering of the sheep, bringing them, bringing them down from the pastures. We're going to stay in northern Macedonia, and this time we're moving down to the village of, or the, the town of Bitola. And this particular costume that Alina is wearing was collected in perhaps 1968 or 1970 by Dennis Boxell, who was the artistic director of, of Kola de Folk Dance Ensemble, which Jonathan Fry and I both danced in before we, we formed Ethnic Dance Theater. On our first trip to Yugoslavia, however, in 1975, we traveled to Skopje and went to rehearse with a group in Skopje and met a young lady whose family was from the town of Bitola and who spoke English. And her parents gave her permission to go with these two strangers to the town of Bitola, where we were able to go into an antique store in the town and collect more pieces, and today I'm happy to tell you that we've got 12 beautiful women's costumes from this particular region. You'll notice the heavily embroidered sleeves. There is, first of all, cross-stitch embroidery, and then chain-stitch embroidery, and then sequining over and above that. You can see that she's wearing Ottoman coins both on as a chest piece and on the apron. These would be indicative of her dowry. The jacket, I'm going to have you turn around slowly here, is of boiled wool. Bitola and the, re the villages around Bitola are very close to the Greek border, so in the town of Buf and Florina, which are on the Greek side of, of the border in, in Greek Macedonia. They wear very, very similar costumes. There's a little bit about the motifs of the, we see on the side here, the tree of life, and it's also representative of the Trinity. Again, I think they're, if we turn back a little bit, I don't know. The very edge of this is also finished in beadwork. Sometimes we see long lacy beadwork. Unfortunately, most of those chemises that have the wonderful beadwork on the bottom, have, the beadwork has come apart from dancing on stage and none of us knows how to reproduce those. The chemise is always open down the front and underneath it they wear a dickey or a placket, made it convenient for, for nursing children and for different sizes. So this was, a lot of Macedonian costumes had this feature where the chemise itself was very plain in the front and then an embroidered piece that they could insert underneath behind the chemise to create the finished look there. So costume from Bitola, Northern Macedonia. And now we return to Croatia for two costumes from the region of Baranja. Baranja is in North uh, Eastern Croatia, it's bounded by the Drava and Danube rivers. Across the border in Hungary, you find Baranja County. There are Croatians that live, of course, on both sides of that political border. But this particular costume, for certain, comes from the villages on the Croatian side. It is, again, made from a very, very fine linen, the women's apron is uh, little geometric prints and she has an over skirt that's pleated, I'm going to have you turn around slowly, 
and we can see this. This, would, this is a really dressed up version of this. I'm going to lift up your skirt here because there's an, all this beautiful embroidery underneath on the dress itself. Now, this particular dress, I'm guessing that typically you would wear a much more plain dress underneath if you have the over sukna or skirt that we have here. But you can't see in this, but raglan sleeves and the fabric is just this wonderful damask weave. Both the man and the woman's costume has this amazing weave and beautiful lace inserts in the costume. The style of these shirts, it's very unusual that, you know, it's this like a baseball jacket or baseball shirt, I should say, where the sleeve is what we call a raglan sleeve. It's not a square piece, it's set in. And then they gather it very tightly all the way around. And it's very weird because it usually gathers underneath your arms. It's not terribly comfortable wear, but it's the most typical cut throughout this part of Croatia into Romania. You find it all the way into uh, Western Ukraine. It's not unusual at all. The man's costume has the most unusual feature, I think, about this one. You'll notice he's wearing an apron. Well, in Croatia, in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, decorative aprons were part of the man's costumes very well, and it survived to a very late date in this particular part of Croatia. And th this, again, these costumes were collected probably around 1970 by Anthony Shea, who was the artistic director of Amman Dance Ensemble, and a woman whose name was Nena Šokić, who was one of the original members of the Croatian state ensemble Lado. And Nena accompanied Tony to Croatia and where they went into the villages and collected these costumes. And when Amman disbanded about 10, 15 years ago, I can't remember ex the exact date, we were the very happy recipients of a set of eight men's and women's costumes from this particular region. And that particular dance will be making its comeback shortly. So watch for that in ethnic dance theaters postings.